So, you want to get into data science, right? <laughs> well, you're in luck because I work as a data scientist at Untitled Company. Wait, I work as a data science at Untitled Company. Hey guys, welcome. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Joe. Oh god damn, this is hard. Oh, guys, welcome to. Oh my. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Joma Tech. Now you might be wondering why am I in my room? Well, that's just how things are gonna be from here on out. So, quick little update. Um, I had to remove my day in a life video, uh, you know, the one that got me most of my views. Uh, I had to take it down because I violated some policies, so that's why it's gone. But today we're going to be talking about something different. We're going to be talking about how to get a data science job at a, you know, a large company like Friendster or MySpace, something like that. First of all, what is data science? Because I have a feeling a lot of people have, you know, misconceptions about data science. So if you do, I would suggest you to check this video I made with um, Engineer Truth. So yeah, check that out and hopefully it will give you an understanding of what data science actually is or what my role is. All right, so let's get to it, to the five tips on how to land a data science job. Number one tip, do an internship and have a technical degree. How I got my first hands-on experience on data science was my internship. And I did my internship in a large untitled company and um, how I got that internship was uh, was I just had a few software engineering background, which you can see, uh, you can see my other internships uh, on the previous videos. But yeah, I had a few internships that's software engineering, and my degree is in CS. I never touched data science before, so that's the thing. So the easiest way is to get an internship, and then usually they will give you a full time offer right after. So here are some examples of good degrees to have: uh, CS. Uh, software engineering, uh, economics, statistics, math, uh, just engineering in general, like system engineering, uh, maybe even environmental engineering, just anything with the word engineering in it, they would you know deem it as technical and they will give you an interview. All right, second tip, learn SQL or SQL. I'm not sure. Um, so when you're gonna start your work as a data scientist, no matter where it is, you're always gonna have to write SQL because you gotta get the data somehow. No matter how fancy your you know, Python is and stuff like that, in the end, usually most companies set up their infrastructure so that you query data using SQL. Why? Because it's an easy language and even like analysts or like business intelligence people, they use SQL. So you know, you'll probably have to use SQL too because it's just easier for them and then because they set up the infrastructure like that, you'll have to use that too. And you also should learn SQL because all of the interviews I got that was related to data science, I had a SQL question. Let me show you an example of question. So I found this take home exam and I will change it a little bit so that the large company, which is not the original untitled large company, but another large company that might or might not be related to transportation gave me this take home exam. So I'm gonna whip it out. So for example, what they would do is they would give you a schema and they would give you a schema. For example, you see ID, client ID, driver ID, city ID, client rating, driver rating, and stuff like that. And then the question would be something like, for each of the cities, uh, San Francisco and Los Angeles, calculate 90th percentile difference between actual and predicted ETA for all completed trip within the last 30 days. And then what you do is you have to write queries for that. Yeah, uh, I'm not gonna go through the answer, but you should, that would give you an idea of what kind of query you should run. Tip number three, learn about success metrics and tracking metrics. That is very, very important and it's kind of hard to learn because it's more about product sense. So why is it important? It's important because when you become a data scientist, you will be the expert on your team on data, right? So imagine if your team is like at McDonald's and you know, you're the main data scientist, then you're the one that will know where everything comes from, like all the data sources and also what to measure for success because you're gonna be the one that the PMs ask you like, okay, how do we know we're doing a good job? How do we know that the introduction of these new hamburgers 
that they're actually successful and making McDonald a better place for people. You know, sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's a lot harder to define these success metrics. I'll give you an example, taking from the same take home exam. So imagine if the YouTube creator app, uh, in case you don't know what the YouTube creator app, it's, uh, it's an app for YouTube creators like myself. And when you click on it, you could see like how many views they're getting, you know, and how many uh, watch time and like what videos performing on what comments are getting. It's basically a tool for creators like myself. So that's basically what the YouTube creator app is. So imagine the YouTube creator app is being redesigned. You know, they're adding CTR metrics, they're adding uh, better interfaces and they have like a, I don't know, just better user interface and like a whole facelift. How do you know that the redesign was successful? And what are the success metrics and the tracking metrics? All right, let me talk to you about the difference between success metrics and tracking metrics. Success metrics is usually the one that the whole team cares about. You know, they're always seeing growth. Usually at a startup, it would be like how many active users you have. For example, notvine.com. Founded a startup called notvine.com where you can share 6.1 second videos. So imagine notvine.com. I would care about how many active users, like on a daily basis, how many unique people actually open the app. You know, I would care about it. That would be my success metrics because that's the main thing I care about for now. And yeah, and then tracking metrics. I wanna make sure, you know, that they're actually, you know, one, real people, or two, having a good time on my app. So what are the tracking metrics? So that would be, for example, let's think about it. Um, I wanna know if they're actually watching a lot of, you know, videos. So tracking metrics can be watch time per active user, and then, or maybe just watch time in general. And then another thing can be like, how many videos are they watching? You know, I wanna make sure that they, they're not just opening the app and doing nothing. And then also, let's see, another tracking metrics would be, you know, how many, uh, how many like force quit do they have? Why do I care about that? Because I wanna make sure, I wanna track the negative stuff too. Like, are my, like, are my apps being uh, buggy? Like if they are and they keep force quitting, then maybe the reason why they spend so much time on the app is because it's really buggy, right? So I have to track these things to make sure that it's not buggy. Basically, you want your metrics to be non-cheatable and represent success on your company. And then the next question, after asking like, how would you, you know, define your success metrics? It would be, how do you test it, okay? So th here's one thing you need to know. You need to know about A-B tests. You need to know about control groups and experimental groups and like how many people do you need in them enough so that uh, enough so that it's statistically significant that you could see the differences, but also to reduce risk of having a shitty product that you launch, right? Because imagine if you're the, the, the launch of the new product or like a feature that you built on notvine.com is incredibly shitty. You don't want everyone, you don't want the whole 50% of your users to be exposed to that experiment, right? So you have to think about ways to, uh, to make sure you don't risk that, but also to get enough information that's statistically significant. All right, tip number four, learn IPython, R, Tableau, or Excel, or whatever to manipulate visualize and interpret data. So why do you need to know all of this? Uh, to be honest, in my personal opinion, a lot of people like to use IPython R because they actually look really, you know, uh, technical and coding intensive. But, you know, honestly, I, I see a lot of good data science only use Excel, right? They just grab the data using SQL, they manipulate it using SQL, and then they just put in Excel to visualize things because the impact is not how technical you are how well you communicate those findings and how well it translate into product recommendations. Now, I'll talk about communication later. Why do you need to learn all of these? Because you know you have to manipulate data. Sometimes SQL can't cut it and you need to visualize the data because you need to communicate them later. So, so imagine you have a lot of data and your company, let's see, let's go back to McDonald's. So what do you do? You do an exploratory analysis. So imagine you're McDonald's and you have a bunch of data about your sandwiches, your, your hamburgers and stuff like that. So what the first thing you can do, you could, you know, use it to download all the data, manipulate them, group them by like, you know, hamburgers or day of the week and stuff like that. And you could discover a lot of things using that. And how would you do it? You would use either Tableau, Excel, R, or Python to manipulate things, right? Because you want to answer questions like, all right, which day of the week um, we have the most sales? And then which hamburgers uh, have, you know, which hamburgers are the most popular? But then you could also say like which hamburgers actually have the highest profit margin plus you know sales like so which one gives you more revenue you know and stuff like that and then which ones are actually losing money because apparently when i worked there uh, ice cream every time they sell ice cream they're actually losing money because employees didn't know how to you know stop putting ice cream so they filled it up too much so they try to teach us how to put ice cream 
but only put around it and leave a big void in the middle so that they save more ice cream. I never did that because I cared about my customers, so I want them to have the best ice cream ever, even if McDonald's losing money. Just saying. So this is why you have to learn uh, stuff like IPython, R, and stuff like that. Yeah, honestly, it doesn't matter which one, just as long as you're fast and you're correct at, you know, creating these uh, visualizations. So yeah, so in the end, use any of these technologies to show your results, to interpret them, and yeah, so that's why you need them. All right, number five, you have to learn to communicate really, really well, because the whole point of a data scientist is to communicate their findings, right? Because if you don't communicate your findings, no one will know, and if no one will know, it's not gonna, it's not gonna flourish into anything. It's not gonna flourish into any products. Learn how to do public speaking, you know, because you're gonna be doing a lot of presentations, you're gonna be talking to a lot of people, so a lot of cross-functional partners, a lot of people like PMs, engineers, and all that, you're gonna be talking to them all the time and you're gonna be presenting to them. Learn how to write better because you can't be presenting to everyone in the company, but you know, whatever you found is valuable for maybe for another team. So how do you do that? You write about it. You know, you write PowerPoints you, or you write an article within your company, you write a post, write an email. That's pretty important too, because like um, writing is a very good medium to reach as many people as possible, especially at work. Learn how to make interesting PowerPoints because uh, when you're gonna be presenting to people or when you're gonna be presenting, you know, uh, your, your article, you want to have graphs and stuff like that. And then you, you don't want it to make it boring. You want it to make it obvious what they're looking at. I mean, I saw, I see a lot of data scientists, they have like graphs with like a shit ton of like fancy crap, but I can't interpret it. Like I look at it and there's shit ton of bars and like colors and stuff like that. But what am I supposed to look at? Dude, I don't have attention span. You know, just like a video creator, you need to, you need to get their attention within the five seconds. That's the same thing with work. If people don't wanna read your shit, you're not gonna have any value added to them because they didn't read your post. So make sure that when you present a graph that it tells exactly what you're supposed to tell. So enough information and it's obvious what you're trying to say and it proves your thesis. So we have the saying, actually I just say that, I don't think it's actually a saying, but here's the thing. If you made an interesting analysis, but no one is there to read your analysis, did you really make an analysis? Hmm, food for thought. But yeah, and then bonus, uh, last one, uh, learn predictive modeling. So this is not super required because, um, well, it's funny because most people, they s optimize on this, learn predictive modeling whenever they think data science because they think data science is really related to like forecasting or like finance. Finance, it would be pretty important because the whole goal of your of your job is to make more money. And how do you make more money? You predict the future so, so that you can capitalize on it. But for us, as like a product data scientist, uh, predictive modeling isn't that important, but it's good to know and it makes you a little bit cooler. So yeah, so it might be useful when you're like forecasting goals and stuff like that, or when you wanna build recommendation systems on your product, but it's not super important, but it adds credibility. And also, you know, so that you can tell your friends that you do modeling. Woo! All right, so yeah, so that's about it. That's five tips on how to land a data science job at an untitled large company. And uh, yeah, I hope, I hope that was useful. I hope that was great. Uh, this is pretty short because I don't wanna go through the details of it, but if you have any question, um, you know, comment down below and I'll try to answer it or I'll try to make another video later on. So yeah. So don't forget to like this video if it, you know, added value to your life and also subscribe if you like my videos and uh, yeah, peace out. Thanks for watching.